I've been watching you There's something about the way you move, baby Ooh, you got swag You got swag You got style You got style And I get butterflies every time I see you smile Hey, so are you ready? Are y'all ready? That is our theme for today. Good morning or early afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. So excited to welcome y'all to today's B Corp certification readiness webinar and preparing you for your B Corp review journey. So I'm Max Hayes. I'm a growth manager with B-Lab US and Canada. I use pronouns he and him, and I'm joining y'all from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on the homeland of the Lene Lenape people. And so a bit of housekeeping um, before I introduce the team who will be helping me run the webinar today. Um, there should be a live caption option available if you need it, but you'll need to manually enable it on your end. And we also invite you all to submit your questions throughout the webinar, but we'd ask that you drop them in the Q&A function of the chat instead of uh, the Q&A box instead of the chat itself. Um, and we'll also hopefully have some time at the end of our web webinar today to answer some questions live that we don't get to in the Q&A. And then any questions that we aren't able to get to today, we'll try our best to send out answers in the follow-up email after this event. So please feel free to take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat and connect with one another, but please make sure your chat is set to everyone and not just the event hosts. Okay, so I am joined today by my co-host, co co Carrie Ann Reeves, who is our Senior Associate of Growth at B-Lab US in Canada, and she's going to be helping present a few slides today and will also be helping out with the chat and the Q&A. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Hey Ron, who will be helping us out with our tech behind the scenes today. And I'm also joined by all of y'all who are calling in from all over the US and Canada. And we are thrilled that y'all are here on this B Corp journey. And we can't wait to welcome y'all into the B Corp community when that day comes. All right, so first off, we wanted to set the context for what this webinar is and who it's intended for. And so this webinar is really intended for folks who are already on their B Corp journey. And this is not a 101 session. Um, so if you're brand new to the B Corp movement, it's likely that this content is not going to meet you exactly where you're at. However, we do have a free introductory course on demand called Becoming a B Corp, which is provides a great overview of B Corp certification, the process, the movement, and the value. Um, so highly encourage you to check that out if you're still early on in the journey, or if you have folks in your network who might be looking to get that foundational um, insight and information. And we'll also drop it in the chat so you guys can grab it, and it can also be found on the US Canada website. So additionally, I wanted to mention that this content is not tailored currently for B Corps that are looking for recertification support. Um, and if that's you, I'd recommend you check out my colleague Alexander's recertification 101 and 102 webinars. Um, and today's session is really intended to give you all the information and resources you need to be successful in preparing for your initial B Corp review process. And so before we begin, um, we'd like to drop a quick poll and, and see and get some responses from y'all. So I'll move us along. So the question for this poll is who thinks they are ready for B Corp certification? Awesome answers are rolling in. We'll wait a second until we get all those results. Keep them coming, y'all. Almost at 100%. Awesome. Okay, looks like we're having some technical difficulties with the chat, but the chat is now live. So please feel free to introduce yourselves after you uh, answer the poll. Okay, so looks like we have a good distribution here on the poll. We have uh, about 27% of folks with yes and no, and the majority it may be not sure. So I think y'all are in the right place. And um, it's important to note that after our time today, we'll ask you a similar question to see how things have changed. And hopefully we get some of those maybe not sure's over to a yes or a no. All right. So now I'll dive into what our agenda is for today. So our agenda for the hour, I'm gonna we're gonna cover the importance of being ready. We're gonna do a quick overview of the legal requirement as well as eligibility and how to opt into the correct track. And then we'll dive a little bit deeper into the scoring component of B Corp certification, as well as impact business models, which are particularly complicated. And then we'll also speak to what the review process is, and I'll provide a quick live demo to try to highlight some key points that will happen during the review process, as well as some functionality within the assessment. 
We'll also try to save some time at the end, like I mentioned, to address some questions live. Okay. So just to help ground everyone, I wanted to remind us that the B Corp movement is about more than getting a seal of approval to use in your branding. It's really about joining a global community of leaders who are accelerating a culture shift to redefine success in business. And our mission at B-Lab is to help foster and build an inclusive, equitable, and regenerative economic system for all people and the planet. And I'm proud to say that as of today, there are over 8,000 certified B Corps operating in 95 countries across 161 industries, but they're all rallying around the one unified goal. And so here's a slide that um, represents just a small snapshot of the B Corp community here in US and Canada. And it's this diverse company, diverse community of companies that really makes the B Corp community so compelling and resilient and really helps accelerate the positive impact that companies can make collectively. And so it's important to note that while many of the companies you see on the screen are larger in size, the vast majority of B Corps are small to medium sized businesses making less than $5 million in annual revenue. And so, like I mentioned, this is not a, a 101 course, and so I won't be covering the core requirements for certification in detail. However, just a quick reminder that every B Corp must have a verified score of at least 80 points in the B Impact Assessment. You must adopt a legal framework that allows you to consider all stakeholders, and then you must make your score transparent on the B Corp directory. But today we're gonna to zoom into the highlighted section of this roadmap on the screen and make sure that you know if you're ready, what to expect and how to prepare for submitting your assessment for review. We'll also speak to the review process itself and how to finalize your certification. Okay, so our first section for today is the importance of being ready. So let's jump right in and figure out how do you know if you're actually ready to submit your assessment for review and why it's so important to know if you're ready. So on average, we see that about 45% of companies who submit their assessment aren't successful in making it through the review process. And so companies are unsuccessful for a variety of reasons, but at the core of it, it's that companies are submitting their assessment before they're truly ready to go through the review process. And so here's some of the common trends that we see that companies that submit their assessment, but don't actually end up certifying. And so the first one on our list here is having no designated B champion to lead the process. Um, once you hit that submit button, it's really important you have a point person who's regularly checking on that assessment and making sure you're staying on top of any tasks that your review analyst is assigning to you. And so having that dedicated B champion is really critical. Next up, we have choosing the wrong track in the B Impact Assessment. As a global certification agency that certifies a wide variety of companies, we have to tailor our assessment to the different impacts that certain industries have, which is why it's critical that you're opted into the correct track before starting the review process. Another one that's common, that, common, that folks commonly make mistakes on is choosing incorrect or not applicable impact business models. And so later in the presentation today, I'll dive a little bit more into some good rules of thumb about impact business models and how to know if you're opted into them appropriately or not. Next up and a very important one is documentation is not being, uh, isn't prepared or isn't available. It's really important that if you're claiming something in your assessment that you have the documentation ready to back it up. Because during the review process, it's likely your analyst will need some documentation to verify some of the answers that you've uh, provided. Next up, we have the legal requirement, not being understood or not being met. Because the legal requirement is a core requirement for B Corp certification, it's essential that you understand how your business will meet it and your timeline for making it uh, finalized. And then lastly, and unfortunately, the largest reason folks uh, aren't successful in their review process is unresponsiveness and communications breakdowns. So again, kind of going back to our first point, really critical, you have a B champion, somebody who's regularly logging into that assessment and monitoring the review process to ensure that breakdowns don't occur and that your review is unnecessarily closed. And so we're going to dig into a few of these topics today and reference some great resources um, that we don't have for the topics that we don't have time to cover. Um, and then what I'm going to do right now is going to actually kick the mic over to Carrie Ann. Um, and she's going to speak a little bit more about our legal requirement, as well as eligibility and track selection. Um, because like I mentioned, these concepts are critical to understanding before you hit submit. 
So I'll kick it over to you, Carrie Ann. Appreciate you. Thanks, Max. Yeah, so now let's dive into the concept of stakeholder governance a bit here. Next slide. Um, so for the purpose of B Corp certification, stakeholder governance refers to a company adopting a legal structure that supports decision making in the interest of all parties affected by the company and its actions, not just those that have financial investment in the company. This legal requirement speaks to the long term systems change that the B community hopes to achieve. B Corps want to create an economic system based on creating value for all stakeholders, like their communities, the environment and their workers alongside shareholders, a system that creates value for the many versus the few. Every company pursuing B Corp certification must change their legal DNA to reflect this by either amending their governing documents to include the language found by using the legal tool on our website, which will be linked in the chat shortly, or if your company is currently registered as an SRC corporation in a state or province where benefit corporation is available, you must transition to benefit corporation status. In some places like British Columbia and Oregon, this ent type of entity is called a benefit company. If you haven't already, we recommend you use our legal tool to understand what your company's legal requirement is, and then speak to your legal counsel, if applicable, about the process for meeting it and if and how it will affect your business. It's important to note that for companies with less than 50 employees, this requirement must be met before certification is complete. For companies with over 50 employees, there is a short grace period. Next slide. It's also important to note that meeting the legal requirement is worth a significant amount of points in the assessment, and it shows up there as the mission lock impact business model question. Max will be going over impact business models, or IBMs for short, later in the webinar, but I want to provide some insight into how this IBM works specifically now as it pertains to the legal requirement for certification. So as you can see on this slide, every company that commits to sign the B Corp agreement will receive 2.5 points on the mission lock question. We'll drop a link to the summary of the B Corp agreement in the chat here, but signing the B Corp agreement is something that all companies who wish to officially certify, regardless of their legal structure, must do. So at a bare minimum, every company who intends to certify should select option one to earn 2.5 points on this question. The legal requirement for sole proprietorships is only to sign the B Corp agreement, and thus they will only be able to earn a max of 2.5 points here. However, if your company is not a sole proprietorship and has already made the necessary legal changes in accordance with the legal tool guidance for your company, you should select option four and will receive the max total of 10 points for the IBM. It is important to note here that if you're certifying as a co-op or a subsidiary of a parent company that has not yet met their given legal requirement, you can only receive 7.5 points on the mission lock IBM. One last important note here is that if you are eligible for and planning to utilize the grace period due to only being able to make the necessary legal changes after the review process has ended, you will only be able to receive 2.5 points on the mission lock question. It will be during your recertification process, which takes place three years from your initial certification, that the additional 7.5 points will be added to your score. This is why we highly recommend that you have the necessary legal change either completed or well underway before you submit your assessment for review. If you have any questions or concerns about the legal requirement, we have some great resources that Max will show you during his live demo, and you can always contact us at certify at bcorporation.net. Next slide. So next we'll be moving on to the topics of eligibility and track. We have seen that these topics can cause some confusion for folks who are in the process of completing the B impact assessment. So I hope to prevent or clear up some of that confusion now. So as you may or may not know, B Corp certification is a company level certification only available to for-profit companies who operate in a competitive market. This means that we do not certify nonprofits, governments, company divisions, or departments. A critical component of determining eligibility for certification is understanding which entities you're trying to get certified and thus which entities need to be represented in your assessment. We commonly refer to this as the scope of your certification or which entities must, must meet the requirements for certification and be represented in your B-Impact assessment. 
If your company is just one entity with no related entities, this is fairly straightforward to determine. However, if you have a parent company or want to certify an entity that has wholly or majority owned subsidiaries, those entities will likely need to be included within the scope of your certification and assessment. When it becomes unclear which entities should be included in your assessment, or if your company just has a complicated organizational structure, we highly recommend that you go through what's called a scoping exercise with B-Lab. Next slide. So you can email certify at bcorporation.net to request such a scoping exercise. Please note that there may be a fee associated with this process, depending on your company's size. Additionally, if your company has over 100 million in annual revenue, you are automatically required to go through a scoping exercise and should email us as early on in the process as possible. If there is even a hint of suspicion that this exercise would be useful to your company, it is highly recommended because it provides a clear path forward in to certification in terms of which entities will need to be included in the assessment, as well as which entities will need to make the necessary legal changes. Through scoping, you will also be notified of any additional requirements that need to be met based on your company's complexity. For example, subsidiaries that certify independent of their parent company will need to make their assessment transparent on their public B Corp directory profile. Next slide. So once you've determined the scope of the business you're trying to certify, you'll want to make sure all relevant entities are eligible for certification at all. It is important to note that B Corp certification assesses a company's potentially negative impacts separately from its positive impacts, and the points you earn on the assessment will only be tied to your company's positive impacts. When pursuing certification, your business will be reviewed for any potentially negative impacts through B Lab's risk standards. Risk standards are additional minimum standards that companies operating in industries or practices with potentially negative impacts must meet to be eligible for certification. If your company operates or has clients in any of the industries listed on the webpage that will be dropped in the chat here, please review the associated PDF listed under the relevant industry. Next slide. Please note that if your company has clients in the following industries and the percent of annual gross revenue that your company earns from these clients exceeds the threshold percentages listed here, your company will not currently be eligible for certification. These revenue thresholds for ineligibility are tied to the current fiscal year, but be aware that B-Lab does consider information from the last five fiscal years during the review. A special note here that if your company serves clients in the defense industry, including private, government, and or NGO, and or offensive firearms and weapons, or prison industries, B-Lab has established specific risk standards that companies must meet to be eligible for certification. Next slide. So now we will switch gears by looking at what is referred to as your B-Impact Assessment Track. Your track is based on three components, your company's size, sector, and location. Making sure these components are input accurately from the start is another critical component to a successful review. It is essential to ensure that you have opted into the correct track as it not only affects the assessment's scoring methodology, but it also determines the questions that you will see in the assessment. Max will be dropping some links in the chat that will help you determine if you're on the right track as I quickly touch on each track component or track driver. So first, it is important to note that the size of your company is determined by your employee numbers based on a full-time equivalency calculation. If you're not familiar with this concept, please be sure to check out the knowledge base article that will be posted in the chat. Next is confirming your company's sector. While there are additional categories you will select based on the industry your business operates in, you must opt into the correct sector as changing the sector will result in significant changes to your assessment. Our friends over at BLAB UK have created a great sector selection tool, and Max has also created a video that dives a bit deeper into this topic, which you can find in the chat. Please feel free to ask track-related questions when we get to the Q&A. Lastly, if, is your company's location. It might be natural to think the country where your business is incorporated is, where, is what country you should list as its country of operations. However, B-Lab defines the country of operations as the one where the majority of your employees are located, 
which may not be where your company is headquartered or incorporated. The country of operations that you select will determine if you see a developed, developed global, or emerging markets version of the assessment. For a list of which countries fall in each category, please see the document that will be linked in the chat. If you are a virtual office, please select your location and continue filling out the assessment. If you have multiple offices, please select the location where the majority of your company's workers are located. Next slide. So for the next section, I'm gonna pass it back over to Max to talk about scores and impact business models. Awesome, thank you so much for walking us through some of those really critical components of certification, Carrie Ann. Um, again, cannot emphasize how important it is to understand your, your scope, who you're certifying and your track, as well as your eligibility. And again, we're here to help support if there's any uncertainty, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So now I'm gonna turn our attention over to the performance requirement or in other words, your score. So as we know, your score has to remain above 80 points in order to become certified. And when you submit your assessment for review, you're gonna have a third party review the answers that you've provided in your assessment to ensure that they're accurate. And during this process, it's really common for scores to fluctuate. And so we recommend that you submit your assessment with at least 85 points before you hit submit, because that'll give you a little bit of wiggle room during the process, should your score drop a few points throughout the review stages. And then so if during the review process, your score does drop a little, no lower than 75 points, you may be given a short improvement period, but it's typically not long enough to make major changes to your business. And then if your score drops below 75 points during the review process, it's very likely your review will be closed so that you can work on improvements and resubmit once the performance requirement has been met. Typically, we ask folks wait at least 90 days before resubmitting so that they can make deep changes to improve their impact. And this is another reason we suggest going in with a few more points than a minimum, just because of how common it is for scores to fluctuate during the review process. So now I'm going to jump into our big topic of impact business models. And so the concept of impact business models is unique to B-Lab, and it also can be worth a large amount of points in your assessment, which is why it's critical to understand impact business models, which we'll commonly refer to as IBMs. <clears throat> and so while most of your assessment is made up of operational questions, which are designed to capture the impact of your business's daily operations, Impact business model questions are focused on capturing the verifiable impacts of business models that are designed to create significant positive effects on stakeholders in a competitive market. <clears throat> Excuse me. IBMs are difficult to receive, and it's not common for a company to have more than one or two. And generally, IBMs will score about 10 points, but they can go as high as 60 points. And so there's a few rules of thumb that I'll go over, which will help you identify whether or not your company truly has one. And I think the best way to do that is just through providing some examples. Um, and so let's, and so in these examples, I'll explain the difference between operations that would be captured in the operational questions in your assessment or certain um, operations that would be captured in the impact business model questions of your assessment. So for our first example here, um, maybe you're paying your local um, waste management company to recycle your business's waste from its daily operations. That would be an example of an operational type question. However, if your company were the one offering the recycling services to other businesses, or if your company's products are made from recycled input materials, those would likely be examples of companies who would receive an impact business model in the environment section for the specific environmental impact that their product or service is creating. So next up, we have charitable giving. So maybe your company is involved in charitable giving. You might donate from time to time to charity, provide some pro bono services to a local nonprofit. Um, but those kind of things, those one-off actions would actually be captured in the operational section. However, if your company were to have a formalized commitment to donate a certain percentage of revenue, time, or products annually to nonprofit organizations, um, and you likely have data to report on the impact and sharing out about that impact, 
It's an example of a highly intentional formalized business model that would likely receive credit in the design to give impact business model because of the positive impact that that commitment has on the community. And so our last example here is around hiring. You might have some great hiring policies and practices, which results in your business having a diverse workforce. But this would actually be captured under your operational questions. In order to qualify for an impact business model around this topic, you would need to have an intentionalized, formalized workforce development program that targets individuals with barriers to employment. That program should be specifically tailored to the individuals that you're targeting. Um, and so in a, that, that would be a great example of this would be folks who are formerly incarcerated. You would need to have a workforce development program specifically designed with training and support to that group's unique needs. You should also be able to share out about the impact of that program. And so a company like this would likely be able to get an impact business model specifically for that unique workforce development program they have targeting individuals with barriers to employment. So I hope those examples help provide some context about the difference between operational type impacts and impact business model impacts. And so it's important to note that there are lots of impact business models all pictured here on this slide. And you can see that they're categorized in the same key impact areas that the operational questions are. Um, it's also important to note that some of the impact business models you see here are only applicable if your company is operating in an emerging market. So a good rule of thumb is if you're filling out that assessment and you find yourself opted into, let's say, three to five impact business models based on the way you're answering questions, you can go ahead and keep answering those questions. But if the score for that specific section is below a point or two, it's likely that you don't actually qualify for that impact business model. And on the flip side, if you find yourself opted into several and you're scoring maybe 60 to 100 points, it's, um, it's likely you want to revisit that to make sure you're answering those questions as accurately as possible, um, because there might be instances where you're double counting impact, and I'll be sure to touch on this topic of double counting impact again uh, in a minute. One other thing that's important to understand is if you're claiming to have an impact business model, the standards team is going to ask you for quite a bit of documentation to verify the positive impact you're claiming your business model is creating. So please be prepared to back up your claims. And so there are some instances where companies may be answering questions aspirationally or answering questions in relation to a program that has just launched or started. However, it's important to note if you don't have the data to support the claims that you're making, it's unlikely you'd be able to receive the points associated for that impact business model. A great example is the design to give impact business model. If you have no record of actually meeting those giving thresholds that you've committed to, it's unlikely you'd be able to get the points associated with it because we aren't able to verify any impact that's being created from this commitment. And a good rule of thumb is we typically would like a full 12 months of data in order to verify impact for a specific impact business model. And so it's really important to understand that IBMs are data heavy and it's okay to wait to opt into them until you feel like you have enough data to substantiate the claim being made. And so now I wanna go back to a point I mentioned a moment ago about double counting. Um, so some folks will find themselves opted into multiple impact business models, right? Companies uh, products might have impacts across a variety of things, but it's really important um, that um, it's really important that you're capturing the main impact of your product or service through the impact business model. And so a great example um, I like to use is around a nursing school. So a nursing school that offers educational courses. So this company might immediately think that they qualify for both at the education IBM as well as the health and wellness IBM. However, it's critical to understand that IBM should capture the main impact of the service offering and not necessarily secondary impacts. So in this case, the customer or the user is educated in the health field. Here, we would likely only award the education IBM because that is the direct impact of this business model. The user is educated in this specific topic. The user then may or may not go on to use that education to deliver health outcomes for another individual. And that's typically why we wouldn't award IBM credit for health and wellness because most companies aren't able to quantify or capture that secondary impact. 
It's also important to note that revenue is the main driver for measuring impact. And so it's critical that revenue streams not be double counted as it would inflate a company's score. So right, if we're taking this company, for example, they're opted into both education and health and wellness, they've likely put the same revenue number in, in both. And that's an example of double counting, right? They're trying to claim that this is having this dual impact, when in reality, impact business models are here to just capture the one main impact of the service and the revenue that's being generated from it. Um, so it's really important when you have multiple IBMs to make sure you're not double counting your revenue. And if you do have multiple, you should be able to break out your revenue streams into those each, each individual impact area. Okay, so there's also a ton of information embedded within the BIA itself, the B Impact Assessment. And so when I go into the live demo, I'll be sure to highlight some key areas to help you investigate and find more information as you're answering questions in the assessment. Okay, so that covers IBMs. We're gonna shift gears a little bit and now dive into the review process. Um, but before we do, I wanna make sure to emphasize the fact that it is common for companies to spend multiple months working towards achieving a self-reported score of 80 points or higher in order to submit their assessment for review. And it's this review process that is central to the B Corp certification and community. It's our process to ensure that B Corps are stewards in creating positive impact and meeting high standards of social and environmental performance. And so before the review, your company's assessment score reflects a self-reported unverified score. And our goal of the review process is to learn more about your business and arrive at a verified score that applies the standards consistently and according to their intent across the B Corp community. So I'm a visual learner, so I love visual representations. And so we've tried to represent the review process visually here on the slide so that you can see the various stages and the estimated timelines for each of these stages. So first, once you feel confident that you've met the requirements for certification, you'll need to submit your assessment for review. Once you submit that assessment, the first task will be to pay your submission fee, which is a one-time fee that covers the cost of the review process. Then you'll be placed in the evaluation queue, which is our first stage here, where you could wait for up to two months for one of our team members to take you through evaluation. So your first stage evaluation, your analyst will take your assessment through a pre-screening to ensure critical aspects of your assessment are accurate, things that, that Carrie Ann touched on. So things like your scope, your track, your involvement in controversial industries, as well as impact business models. Um, so it's kind of like a quality control stage to make sure that you're ready to, to keep progressing deeper into the review. So once you make it through that evaluation stage, you'll move into a secondary queue called the verification queue. And here you'll be um, asked to upload additional documentation. And again, you could wait for up to two months for an analyst to be assigned to your company. But again, you'll be working on things like gathering documentation and other tasks like that. And so during verification, your analyst will schedule a call with you to get to know you and your business a little better, and they will review your questions and responses in greater detail. And so it's important to note as well that once your company enters that verification stage, you're no longer working with B-Lab US in Canada. Your standards or your verification analyst is actually a third-party verifier, and that's actually considered best practice for certification agencies as it creates a clear separation of power and prevents conflicts of interest. But what this means for you all is that your experience might vary a little bit in verification and it's really critical that you stick to the deadlines your analyst gives you and you over communicate when deadlines cannot be met or if more time is needed. And in the live demo, I'll be sure to show where this communication is happening so that you can make sure you're giving your analyst relevant information and asking for extensions as needed. So if you get through that verification stage with a score of 80 points or higher, you've done it. You can now certify as a B Corp after you sign the term sheet and pay your first year certification fee. Then our community team will invite you to an onboarding call and welcome you into the community. On the flip side, if your score drops below 80 during that review process, um, your review will likely be closed and then you can begin working on improvements again um, to resubmit that assessment and try again. Um, 
I'll also show some great ways to help uh, utilize tools within the assessment to improve your score in case you find yourself in that situation. But again, if your review is closed, it's not the end of the world, wait a few months and resubmit again when you're ready and confident that you can meet that performance requirement. Okay, so now we'll move on to a concept called review approaches. So you'll notice in that previous slide, we didn't include exact timelines or deadlines for each stage. And that's because those timelines depend on which review approach gets assigned to your company. So I'd really encourage you all to uh, review the decision tree linked on this slide um, that we'll also drop in the chat here in a moment to identify the approach that will be assigned to you to get a better sense of what that timing timeline might look like during the review process. So as some of y'all may know, over the past few years, B-Lab has had a hard time managing the growing demand for certification with our current capacity and systems. However, I'm really happy to say that we've made some amazing progress since, and we've not only been able to grow our capacity, but to bring wait times way down. Unfortunately, there is still a short waiting period between when you hit submit and when you'll be assigned an analyst. And as you all now know, there will be, uh, you'll be assigned to two different analysts during your review process, one for the evaluation stage and one for the verification stage. And while the total length of the review process is dependent on your company's approach, we are able to estimate the wait times before each of those stages. And so currently we're seeing that there's an average wait time of about two months in the evaluation queue um, and about one month in the verification queue. And so again, like I mentioned, while these stages are called queues, there still will be additional tasks that must be completed while you're in these stages. So please don't ignore them as it could result in uh, you not getting assigned an analyst if you have incomplete tasks, which will either draw out your review process timeline or result in your review being closed due to unresponsiveness. So please don't ignore the queue stages. Okay, so we've covered a lot of information very quickly, and I'm sure many of y'all are wondering, well, this is all great, Max, but how do I actually know if I'm ready to hit submit? And so I would say here are the four items you're really going to want to consider and make sure that you can answer yes to before you hit submit. So the first one here is I really recommend you try for an unverified score of at least 85 points before hitting submit because it is very common for scores to fluctuate during the review process. The second thing to ask yourself is whether or not you feel confident backing up your score or your answers with documentation. Highly recommend checking out these two articles linked here that will give you some great tips on preparing your documents. The other thing to ask yourself is does your team have the capacity to go through the review process right now? As you can see, it is a rigorous process and it takes significant time and maintaining consistency in who's leading and taking the company through is really important to ensuring a successful review process. And lastly, and very importantly, is your team clear on your legal requirement, your transparency requirement, and have you reviewed our fee structure? So again, if you can answer yes to all of these questions, you're likely in a great place to submit your assessment and be well set up for a successful review. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit more about documentation. Um, so understandably, we get lots of questions about documentation and uploading documents might actually be a little less work than you might think. So our analysts will actually request the information that they need from you at various stages in the process. But here's some insight into what um, your analyst will be looking for once you hit that assessment, once you hit that submit button um, and submit your assessment for review. So like I mentioned, the majority of our community is made up of small to medium sized businesses. And so they typically end up on the small medium approach. And so for these companies, you should be prepared to provide information on your employees, um, including their salaries, as well as your suppliers and your facilities. We're also going to need the most recently completed PL statement as well. Um, and so if you're curious about learning more about the standardized information we ask for for businesses on the small medium approach, I'd encourage you to check out the links we're dropping in the chat. For companies who are smaller than this, you would need to provide a little less documentation. And for companies that are larger than this, we'd likely ask you to provide a little bit more. Um, and yeah, so there's a few rules of thumb for companies of all sizes, though. Um, and so if a question is scoring one point or more, it's a good rule of thumb to be prepared to provide some documentation on that. 
Next up, if your company is operating in a controversial industry or if you have clients in a controversial industry, please be prepared to provide extra documentation up front because it's likely one of the first things your evaluation analyst is going to want to confirm. Um, and so we're typically going to want to know what service you provided to companies in that industry, how much revenue is coming from it, things like that. And then lastly is to keep an eye out on your verification report, which I'll show in our live demo. But this report is populated after you complete the evaluation stage. And it's basically your verification analyst telling you which questions are going to need documentation in order to support the answer you've provided. Perfect. So that leads us right into the live demo. Let me take a moment here to get the account pulled up. Carrie Ann, can you let me know if we're seeing the test account now? I can see it. Perfect. Awesome. So here is a test account. Um, and one thing you'll notice is the dashboard is a great place to review your company and see where you're at. So you'll always see this next steps field here, which will tell you what you need to do either to submit your assessment or maybe what your analyst is asking from you. Um, like Carrie Ann mentioned, having your track details correct is critical, and you can update them from the dashboard as well. So if after our time today, you're like, man, I need to make some updates, you can just do that right here on your dashboard, and you'll likely see your score change and some new questions show up in your assessment. You can also see which approach you've been assigned. Um, as you can see, this is what you would look like if you were recertifying, but for a new company, it would likely say, um, you know, small, small, medium, medium, or large. You can also see some great overviews of your scores and things like that. But once you hit that submit button, you're going to see a new tab show up here called the reviews tab. And it's in this tab is where the whole review process is going to occur. So you can see here the stages we mentioned earlier, the evaluation queue and the evaluation. Um, so each stage will have certain tasks that will need to be completed. And your analyst who's assigned will help you work through each of these stages. You can actually see that all of the communication is going to happen here as public comments. Let me see if I can find one with some comments to show y'all. So here we go, exactly like this. So it'll look like um, your analyst will leave you a comment like this. Your review has been, for example, this one has been paused. And then I would respond and say, hey, I'm ready to review the review. And then your analyst would see that. So it's really important to note that all of the communications during the review are gonna happen in each individual task as back and forth comments. And you'll see that there'll be due dates assigned to you as well as um, if it's assigned to you or assigned to the analyst. So let's say the analyst assigns you to upload some IBM documentation. You go ahead and do that. You leave a public comment saying, yep, I did it. It's done. It'll automatically reassign that task from you back to the analyst and let them know that it's time for them to review your documents. And so like I mentioned, the verification report is going to be really important when it comes to documentation. And you'll notice there's this little report section over here. And if you hit the drop down, you'll see a report called verification report. And so this is the report you'll start to see when you move into verification. And this basically means your analyst has flagged these questions as uh, ones where they're going to need some additional documentation. So if you see the little cloud icon, they're looking for an actual document to attach as an attachment via the public comment fate, via a public comment. So here you can actually go in and attach a document to the comment. And then if you see the little text box field highlighted, they're basically looking for a comment of you explaining why you've selected the answer you've selected. So you don't necessarily need to upload a document. They might just be looking for your methodology for how you got to that answer or a little more context about the way you responded. So that covers our verification report. Now I want to cover a few key functionality pieces within the assessment itself. And so as most of y'all are likely spending the majority of your time here in the question filter, um, it's really important to note that almost every question will have a feature under here called learn more, where you can, <clears throat> excuse me, where you can find additional information about the question or maybe even some examples. So if you're ever confused or stuck on what the question's asking, always recommend checking out the learn more feature. The learn more feature wasn't helping you. You'll notice there's this little get help box floating around in the corner. This is a great place to find additional resources as well as it connects right to our knowledge base. So maybe you're looking for the full-time equivalency calculation formula to calculate um, your employee numbers. You can just look full-time right in here and you'll find the article explaining exactly how to calculate it. 
If you click the little arrow right here, it'll bring you into our whole knowledge base, which is again, a great repository of articles to help you um, navigate things like how to's, best practice guides. And you can also submit a ticket to us if you're struggling to interpret a question or looking for some more guidance. Um, you can also do that directly through the get help button just by hitting contact and logging a ticket through here. Um, another important feature under the within each question is this bookmark feature and the goal feature. Great way to flag certain questions for yourself that you want to come back to. And the goal feature is really powerful if you're trying to make some improvements. You can actually set goals for yourself and get email reminders about specific questions and topics. So if you know you want to have a build a higher level of corporate oversight, maybe create a board, you can actually set some goals for yourself, set some due dates, get email reminders. So this tool is just a really powerful place to keep your B Corp journey going and keep deepening your company's impact to hit that score of about 85 points. Um, and also, if you're struggling to get to that 80, 85 point bar, the improvement report is another really powerful feature. This report is essentially pulling all the questions where you're not scoring the maximum so that you can go in, identify low hanging fruit and make some game plans to increase your score. Really quickly, I also wanted to just highlight on our website, we have some great resources here as well under the certification support resources tab where you can find all of our public facing resources and many of the resources we've dropped in the chat today. So definitely make sure to check this out whether you're looking for guides on how the approach will vary based on your company size or things like templates for local purchasing. So highly encourage folks to go check this out. Really powerful place. And that is the end of our demo. We're running out of time. So I will stop us there and get us back into the slides. Okay, now we're ready for poll round two. So let's see how y'all are feeling now. Just wait a moment while we get that up. Appreciate you bearing with us for the last 45 minutes, but I hope y'all are feeling a little more prepared. Let's see if the numbers say the same thing. Okay, awesome. Answers are rolling in. Almost at 100% here. Awesome. Okay, perfect. We're looking great here. Okay, so we've got a lot of folks, almost a half now feeling yes, about a third feeling no, and we got our maybes or not sures down to about 20%. So I feel like that's a good sign. <clears throat> but again, if y'all have any questions, especially the maybe not sure folks, please don't hesitate to reach out to us to get more information that you might need. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also wanted to flag really quickly <clears throat> that there are some ways that you can um, find additional resources. So for example, if you did say no on that poll, please be sure to reach out directly to me and schedule some time at my office hours so I can clear up any of your lingering questions or concerns. Make sure you have what you need to keep moving forward. You can also email certify at with any of your questions or also reach out to a consultant if you need a deeper level of support um, than B-Lab is able to offer. So just wanted to flag those resources for y'all on how to keep that momentum going. I also wanted to flag really quickly that we've updated our equity pricing policy to recognize the continuous barriers that historically marginalized communities face in starting and growing their businesses. And this new policy seeks to promote equity and access to the B Corp community by adjusting your annual certification fees, as it is an opportunity to lean into our justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion values as an organization. So this program became effective as of January 1st this year, and offers annual certification free fee discounts into three tiers. So please be sure to review our structure and you can actually apply for the discount manually within the B Impact Assessment itself. But if you're ever struggling to figure out how, don't hesitate to shoot us an email and Carrie Ann can help you get that squared away. So the last thing I wanna mention, the very last thing I wanna mention, I promise, before we get into our Q&A is that the B Corp standards are slated to change in 2025. Um, and so as our climate crisis intensifies and social inequity grows, we need to bring about systemic change. And um, we must advance the B Corp standards to meet the challenges and the magnitude of the problems ahead. And so B-Lab has been constantly re revising their standards. Um, we've actually gone through six iterations over the 17 years B-Lab has been, been around. 
Um, but we've reached a vital juncture in the evolution of our standards where we're going through a larger update. And so we wanna make sure that we share with you all the latest draft of those standards um, so that you can see where we're headed as an organization. Our colleagues at B-Lab Global have developed an awesome microsite um, so that you can kind of dive into these standards and make sure you understand where we're headed. So we'd really encourage y'all to check that out. Um, it's important to note that no company will certify on these new standards until 2025. Um, so for those of y'all who are thinking about submitting this year, you won't need to worry about this. Um, it wouldn't apply until you recertify three years later. Okay, so now let's open things up for questions. I will stop sharing my screen real quickly and carry on. Please feel free to elevate any questions in the chat um, or the Q&A that haven't been addressed yet. Yeah, okay. I'm going to voice over really quick um, one of them that isn't answered yet from Brenda Cruz. Uh, do the public comments remain just within the verification process, or do they ultimately end up publicly available with our report when posted on the B Corp directory? Great question. So all the information you enter in the B Impact assessment itself is um, protected. It will never be shared publicly. We don't share any information publicly without your consent first. So by public comments, what we mean is that um, anyone who has access to your B Impact assessment, so any other coworkers you've added can view public comments, and then the analysts can view public comments. But people outside of, of B Lab itself, employees, will not be able to view your public comments. And actually, we won't typically make your whole assessment transparent once you hit that, once you are certified. So it's really only our largest companies or companies that are subsidiaries of other companies that aren't B Corps that need to make their whole assessment transparent. And even then we typically don't publish public comments. So public comments is really your place to work. You can be confident that that data won't be shared with anyone besides the other employees who have access and the analysts who are working on your account. So think of the B Impact Assessment as your sandbox, your place to put all your notes, resources, tools, and they'll be protected by our data privacy policy. Um. There's a question from Philip Bowman that says, when I click on the B Impact Assessment, starting with governance, it does not allow me to click on the appropriate bubble to reply to the questionnaire. Um, Philip, I don't know if we have a ability to like let you come off mute and share more about that, but it sounds more like potentially a technical difficulty. Um, so if you are still experiencing that, you can definitely just email certify at bcorporation.net with maybe like a screenshot of what you're looking at. Um, and I can try to troubleshoot, or you could also hop on an office hours call with Max and walk through it live. But, yeah, I think that's yeah, a great recommendation, Carrie Ann. Um, there will be a recording of the webinar shared afterwards and the links that were in the chat will be um, I believe included in the resources. If not, most of them live within the certification support resources that was shared um, from the US Canada website. So that should be all good. Um, Yuri is asking, is it recommended to go through the assessment to see your business's initial score? And the answer to that is certainly, You, we do recommend companies uh, take a benchmark first try at the assessment just to see where they're landing in terms of score and um, how much work it takes and, and if there's a capacity for it on the team because um, that's important to know ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. I think it's really important to note that, again, we're not going to be looking at assessment until you hit that submit button. So that's really your place to go through, get a benchmark of your business. It's our free tool available to you. The average company scores about 50 points. And so filling out and getting that baseline will help you figure out where you're at. Maybe you're in that 50 to 70 and you need to make a game plan on how to get to that 80, 85 points before you hit submit. We have some great tools on our website, as well as that improvement report, which can help you identify how to get from that baseline place to that um, score of 85, where you're going to be ready to hit submit. Um, and just a reminder, if you can put the questions that you guys are putting in into the Q&A function, it'll be easier to sort them rather than the chat. But I can voice over um, a couple that just came in through the chat instead. Um, so 
Uh, Case Kuhn is asking, I'm working on certification as a volunteer on behalf of a California Benefit Corp uh, Climate Action Now, which is currently only has two FTEs. I am dedicated to being the champion of the process. Is there any issue with my leading the process as a volunteer? Um, so I would say to this, there's no issue with you volunteering your time. That's actually super cool that you're doing that uh, just pro bono. I would say that it is important that the organization itself uh, has at least one person who knows what's going on as well, um, even if they're relying on you as like a consultant, um, because once you, you know, maybe when you're done with the process, if you're the only one who knows what exactly happened and no one at the company does, then that does not set them up for long-term success with their recertification. Um, so I would just make sure there's at least one person who's like, also being on on top of it uh, with you knows what's happening. But otherwise there's no issue with someone outside of the organization like helping with the assessment. Yeah, exactly. And there's also a whole um, network of consultants out there who support companies on this journey. And they'll oftentimes kind of lead that process as well. But like Karen was mentioning, really important to make sure the company is bought in and understanding it. So they're set up for success in the long run. And then I see a question here from Matt. This is a great one. How much involvement will our team have outside of our point person? Um, so this is a great question. So once you do hit that submit button and you're going through the review process, that point person will be the one kind of communicating back and forth with the analyst via those comment functions I showed in the reviews tab. Um, but it'll be the other team members who will be supporting that individual. So let's say the analyst says, oh, you've said you used um, recycled input materials. Can you show me how? That point person will likely need to go to their team, whoever manages um, you know, that and collect all of the data. So it'll be really important to build what we call a B team or maybe a few leaders from each department or a department head so that that point person can go to these folks and say, hey, my analyst is looking for these documents. I don't have them. We have about four weeks to get it together. What can we do to pull this together? So again, um, it totally depends on how much documentation you gather ahead of time versus maybe how much new documentation you might need to be pulling together during the review process. Um, but if you're really prepared, you have your documents ready to go, there shouldn't be a huge amount of involvement with other team members besides that one kind of going back and forth until you get certified, which will be really important to bring all of your employees and broader team members into the, what does it mean to be a B Corp and helping them understand how it's directing your business and its growth. Yep. And then I think we have time for one more question that I've got here. Um, so it's from Yuri and it says, uh, is it a full-time job or part-time if we are starting at about 50? And I don't know if I'm understanding correctly, Yuri might need to provide a little bit more clarification around what 50 means. But um, in terms of whether a person who's working at the company is considered a full-time worker or part-time worker, um, we have a calculator based on how many hours per week that person is working and how long potentially they've been working at the company, um, which is included in the full-time equivalency article that was shared earlier. Um, and if that, if you're like, I lost that link, it, totally understandable, just go into our knowledge base um, uh, and just search in the search bar like full-time worker or something like of that nature and it'll it'll come up um but yeah that is all the time we have here uh we have one last ask of folks um we use survey data to figure out if we're doing a good job with these webinars and so uh i think hey ron or max is gonna drop a link to that survey if you could just go ahead and fill that out it should take like only like a minute of your time um, and it really helps us yeah, we really appreciate y'all's feedback. And again, if you have any lingering questions, don't hesitate to sign up for your office hours with me, um, especially things like how much involvement your company might need to invest totally depends. And so we can have those more detailed conversations, but glad to feel that y'all are having some more clarity leaving this webinar. And we wish y'all the best of luck on your B Corp journey and the review process. And we're here cheering y'all on. Awesome. Well, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. And yeah, okay. So Heron just mentioned, you'll be sent the survey when we close the Zoom. So keep an eye for that little window and we'd really appreciate it if y'all could take an extra minute to fill that out. Sweet. All right. Everyone have a good rest of your day.
See ya.